Afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you're all doing well and you, you're having a good day. Um, this afternoon, we've got three talks coming up in this room. Uh, so we're going to kick off with Jim Manico talking about cross-site scripting. So over to you. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing today? All right, let's try that one more time. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Let's get to work. We're going to talk about cross-site scripting defense. I have given talks of this nature so, much, so many times. This is my promise to myself to be my last XSS defense talk ever. I'm going to find new things to talk about, but we still have stuff to work through. We're going to define what cross-site scripting is briefly. We're going to look at output escaping, HTML sanitization, safe use of JavaScript, sandboxing of dangerous content, safe use of JSON in the browser, as well as content security policy, which gives us pretty much the total body of knowledge around cross-site scripting defense. So this is my personal grid that I use in class. This is my commercial deck, which I've re-licensed as share like a, a, a Creative Commons so people can use it commercially. So this is, what, and this is my favorite deck. I put like years of work into this. So I think open sourcing it is a personal big deal for me. It's done. Please use it and spread the word. Let's get to work here. My name is Jim Manico. I'll be your presenter for today. The real Jedi behind my business and my life is this blue person, who's my wife, Tracy. She's the real Jedi behind the scene. But uh, I'm very grateful to be here. Let's do this. this and I, I want this talk hangs off another talk by Dr. Mario um, Heinrich, who's probably one of the best cross-site scripting attack thinkers that I know of on the planet. He's here giving a talk, and his perspective is XSS is dead. We don't get it from a defensive point of view. Very few people take this seriously. That, that talk is complementary to what I'm going to talk about today as well. So what is cross-site scripting? It's First of all, it's a misnomer. It's the wrong name. Cross-site scripting as a name needs to go away, and it should be called JavaScript injection or attacker-driven JavaScript. It's also the most common web vulnerability by any measurement I've seen, and it's also very easy to find via auditing to some degree. That's debatable. It's also easy to exploit. You just need to know JavaScript. And you know, individually, fixing cross-site scripting is sometimes easy with each individual problem. But the scale of the problem is dramatic. Everybody has XSS in their apps for the most part. And last, it's easy to reintroduce during development. And, and the impact is really damaging. And a lot of managers don't take cross-site scripting seriously because how, because how often it shows up. I'm here to say it's, it's something we have got to deal with if we want a secure application. And we have to deal with it more than we deal with it today. Having OK XSS defense, in my opinion, means you have no XSS defense. You either got to take this seriously and rigorously, or don't worry about it. Because again, most people do it in what I would call a half-ass way. And I want you to do it as a primary defensive layer of your app. For those who are new at XSS, the hacker is one of many ways to launch XSS against a victim. I'll send a link with an XSS payload in it to a user who clicks on that link. The payload's reflect, reflected in the, user in, the, in the user interface, and one of many attacks could be stealing of data, defacing the site, and similar. This is what we mean by XSS. You're injecting JavaScript into a website that a victim, another user of that site, runs into in some way. Now, what do these, and there's many kinds of XSS delivery mechanisms. I can embed it, evil JavaScript, into your site. I can put it on a URL as a reflective vector. Or I can do DOM-based XSS between inner JavaScript interaction. There's actually a couple other payload types. But uh, 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 there's actually a couple other payload delivery types. But let's look at actual payloads. Again, eventually, the victim runs across JavaScript that your developers never built. What kind of payloads can we do here? So this is the basic XSS payload I've seen in a lot of classes, where I'm building an evil URL, I'm grabbing a copy of the cookie, and sending it to a different domain. This would launch in the victim's browser, steal their cookie, pass it to my server, where I can then use it to hijack that account. So here's my question. Is HTTP only an important defense in browser security today? Do you think, this is a question for you, you have to answer now. Do you think HTTP only 
is an important defense in secure coding today. What's your, what's your opinion? Shout it out. Who says yes? No, no show of hands. I want a verbal response. Who here thinks HTTP only is valuable? Shout yes. 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 Who thinks HTTP only is not a valuable defense? Shout no. no. It's about half and half. Here's my take on it, right? First of all, HTTP only stops JavaScript and other client-side scripts to access cookie data. We usually recommend that we use this for session IDs for developer. I'm here to tell you that this defense is almost useless. Here's why. Here's my bypass. I build a, remember, I'm storing this in your site, launching it in, vict, in users of your site. I'm already in your domain, Ajax, to your mail endpoint, to your boss, your jerk. There, sorry about that, boss. So there's a, th this Ajax call is in your code. Does HTTP only help you here? No, because the cookie gets attached automatically to this request. Will the same site token stop this request forgery? No, it's in your site. Will, a, will the new token binding standard for tokens help you? No, it's in your site. So I don't need to steal your cookie. I can force your browser to use the cookie. That's a kind of stored forgery. So that's the perspective of attackers. I was teaching this for years until recently. Mario said, Jim, I don't care about HTTP only. Here's how I would abuse it. So let's rethink how important that is. I still think you should use it, but it's trivial to bypass. Here's, here's Twitter. This, they had this malformed URL back in 2010. This JavaScript got to ride free because of their inappropriate, improper URL parsing. That JavaScript got to ride free, it includes everything here. And what this attack did was it grabbed a copy of the CSERF token and replayed it in a worm-like fashion so millions of people were tweeting about a love of goats that's actually quite illegal in most of the southern United States, at least. Let's move on. So here's a virtual site defacement. The bad team is obviously Liverpool. Liverpool kicks worse than my mom. And here I am overriding the entire, I'm just kidding, I don't even watch Liverpool, sorry. So it's document.body.innerhtml. What does that overwrite? The entire page, right? Full site defacement. Here, here I am with XSS, where I'm trapping the password submission event and using that same image trick to steal your password. Here's XSS with no letters. Here's XSS with no letters or numbers. Here's XSS, your entire city, using beef and, and an intercepting proxy. Here's like, oh yeah, just use Markdown. Well, here's XSS against Markdown, right? Here's XSS that's a polygot from one of the best in the world, Gareth Hayes. Hey, Gareth, are you here? Gareth, he's here, find him. One of the best in the planet. This is a polygot test that will work in a JavaScript title, style, text area, XMP, and other contexts. It's interesting for you penetration testers. Here's one test I can fuzz across the whole app. It'll pop everywhere. This is Creative Commons. You'll get these slides. Here's Dr. Mario Heinrich. He's, number, he's the best out there. He is. Here he is doing a fetch to pop your login page, then use a call to rewrite the domain to evil.com. So show your login form, then rewrite it to an evil domain. This is a really cool attack. And here's Kodo from, from Google. Hey, Mario, that's three lines. I made it two lines, and I can make it less. And they're fighting over how to reduce the payload. It's awesome. What else? Here's, let's, let's go mine cyber, cyber coins through XSS, right? So the, what, what, why am I showing you these? You've got to take this seriously. This is not just innocent defacement. This is complete ruination of your authentication layer, of, your, of displaying content, of protecting content. This is a game over event. We have to do better at taking this seriously. As Mario is telling us, look at the history of the last 10 years. We have not taken this seriously. And it, oh, most apps are littered with this vulnerability class. So how do we stop this problem? We stop this, on, and it's, it's complicated. Here's my philosophy on XSS defense. Assume every variable is dangerous. The whole concept of taint tracking is BS when it comes to defense. Don't look if the variable is dangerous. It's a waste of your time. Build a user interface where every variable is automatically protected. That's, that's a better defensive strategy as an architect. Also, make sure that every variable and all content that is, that's added is protected in the UI layer itself. We don't want to depend on things like validation or a WAF. <coughs> Excuse me, I heard Steven say that word. Sorry. You can't depend on these compensating controls to save you. I think we should build user interfaces that are self-protecting. And be careful of developers who are using these new frameworks and turning off the security. 
by the way, dangerously set inner HTML in React, that's a dangerous thing to do. And it's a good lang set that they name it dangerously. This is my personal like printout sheet that I put in my cubicle when I am coding a user interfaces. I encourage you to print this out, clean it up as you see fit, and distribute this to your developers. The slide, are we taking a picture? Wait, 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 picture, 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 picture. Wait, 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 wait. All right, picture, picture. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, picture. <laughs> come on, come on. Got it? Okay, thank you. Let's, let's do this properly. Okay, so, so the first layer of defense, right, is encoding. Are we all aware of encoding? What kind of encoding do we need to do in the user interface to stop XSS? This is layer one defense, circa late 90s till today. We want to do contextual output escaping. Every major language has an escaping library. We're taking dangerous characters like this, which the browser thinks is code, and converting it to display data. This is just the less than sign displayed, not actually code in the browser per se. And what we should do is validate everything, and even if it's valid, still escape it. Because you know, valid data is still dangerous data in the context of secure coding. What makes this problem more difficult is we have to escape differently based on the context of where we're putting data in an HTML document. This really makes the problem more difficult. We have a, a library at OWASP written by Dr. Jeff Ikonowski, who built a really rich encoder for the Java programming ecosystem. It's one of the most frequently used Java encoders in the world today for, for Java. And so what this means is for every different location in a website, I need a different kind of escaping. And we have the same functions in .NET. And so for attributes, a diff we need a different kind of escaping here. Encode for attribute. For like a URL fragment, we need a different kind of escaping. Anybody want to tell me how to escape properly in this context? It's a hard question. So here I am. The black is my code. The red is content I'm adding to the URL dynamically. Anybody want to tell me how to escape in this context properly? Defenders, come on. Number one, look, look what context is this in? Number one, it's in a URL. And number two, it's in an attribute. So how do we escape this? Well, uh, the way is like this. As I'm building the URL, I escape for URL. And as I take that URL and add it to an attribute, I escape for the attribute context. This gets a little hairy. This is a common mistake that developers will make. What else do we have? And, he, and by the way, suppose you're allowing a user to submit a URL. A common place I see is a user profile with an entry to add their home page, which we then turn into a hyperlink. Well, you, we have to disallow JavaScript links is the issue here. This is one area of programming I need to do some kind of validation to make sure the URL is not a JavaScript URL. And I'm doing this not with a regular expression. I'm doing it with the URI class in Java or .NET or similar, and programmatically making sure that there's no JavaScript scheme or protocol being used. So another area of XSS defense. Now, when we have a complete URL, I need to escape it for attributes in the attribute and for normal HTML escaping between two tags. The point I'm trying to make here is I'll have a piece of content, a URL. It's valid. When do I escape it? Do I escape it before I put it in the database? Or do I escape it, uh, or do I escape it uh, after when I'm building the user? Do I escape it when I, before I put it in the database? Or do I escape it when I'm adding it to the user interface? A lot of people want to escape before it goes in the database. I recommend against that because we may have, when we extract data from a database, we may have to escape it the same piece of data may need to be escaped differently based on the context of display. So I think our focus should be escaping in the user interface. Here's an, if, here's an interesting one. If you're doing old school programming with inline JavaScript, then we want to quote and do JavaScript escaping when we're adding data to JavaScript space as a developer. This is a little, little tricky. And why, why is this a bad idea? Why should we never have to do this? Why should we never have to do JavaScript escaping in a properly built application? Because we should not be allowing, as a developer, inline JavaScript. All of our JavaScript should be in a separate JS file if we plan to use content security policy. So we tend to discourage uh, kind of programming like this. So this, uh, this take, and one last one, CSS, right? If I'm adding data to a style, I want to use CSS encoding. And for all these contexts, we want to have a, we want to quote those variables as well. 
So this is not escape, this is not exciting, but this is fundamental knowledge to building secure applications. I'm open sourcing this because you hackers, you penetra penetration testers, please steal this. Put your, put your name on it, I don't care. And use it to educate developers around how difficult this problem really is. You know, I, I, not a, this is, I could teach a full day course on this. It is that complicated. So a few notes, this is always going to be unsafe. This is like saying, I'll take your data and eval it. This is XSS by design. So be careful of the, there's some slots in an HTML document we just can't put data into safely ever. Also, be careful of developers who disable framework security. So dangerously set inner HTML, what framework is that for? That's React turning off their default escaping. Do a search on this and you'll see, you'll usually find XSS. What about bypass security trust HTML? Where's that? That's Angular, right? This good language security really warning developers, this is dangerous to use. So look out for those as a security analyst. The future should not be manually escaping. Look at Go templates. It does all the escaping for you automatically. A lot of developers tell, a lot of security people say that the double escaping of URLs, that's overkill. Well, here's Google. I have a URL fragment, and they're doing both URL escaping and attribute escaping. This is very sharp brain power that build this. So I'm leaping off of that logic in recommendations I make in class. So let's look at the next series of defenses here. So we covered the top here. We covered manual escaping. We covered avoid JavaScript URLs and all the different kinds of escaping. Let's look at some of the more advanced techniques that's necessary to build a secure application today. So the next step is when can we not escape? If we're slinging HTML, suddenly escaping is not the right defense. Where does HTML show up? Well, if you're using tiny MCE, you're literally letting users of your app use a WYSIWYG editor. When you hit submit, it's a big chunk of HTML. Why can't we just escape that chunk of HTML in the user interface to provide security? Why is that not the right answer? What's that? It's not, if you escape it, it's not HTML. It's what, not what will you see? If you escape this HTML, what will you see on screen? Text. You'll see the HTML text. Will it be safe? Yes, but it, you, your application will have been broken. So go, you can't escape HTML. We need to use some kind of HTML sanitizer. We at OWASP, Michael Samuel from Google, who is a security engineer, does actual coding, wrote and continues to maintain this project for the Java ecosystem. And I think the most important library in HTML sanitization is Mario, Dom Purify. We'll look at that in just a second. So server side, when you're sending me a chunk of HTML, I can build a policy and just say policy sanitize the HTML and give me safe HTML. As a quick aside, it's almost impossible to detect if a chunk of HTML is insecure. Like I want an API that says, is this HTML safe or not? No language does that well. What I can say is, here's a policy, here's the tags I'm gonna allow, please remove any content that doesn't fit those tags and do a sanitizing round. One of the rules of secure coding is you validate, and if those validation rules fail, what should we do with that content? You're submitting content to my web service. You, my validation rules say it's invalid content. What's my next move? Drop the whole request. But when it comes to HTML sanitizers, we don't have that luxury. Get, take bad HTML from a user with attacks in it, sanitize it, and then put the sanitized version of this content in the database is usually my recommendation. It's a strange case in the world of security, in my opinion. And a lot of people make mistakes here. If you're a .NET author, there is no good sanitizer in the .NET ecosystem. And I'll just look at where you're doing HTML authoring. I almost always find an XSS endpoint there because of the lack of this in some languages. This is why DOM Purify is so important. With DOM Purify, it's a JavaScript library. It's non, you don't have to configure it. It's very, it's very tolerant of HTML and JavaScript. It's high speed using browser native constructs. So I can, t by the way, inner HTML, is that safe to use? Is inner HTML a safe construct to use in JavaScript from a security perspective? No, no it's not, because I, any content that gets to inner HTML 
will XSS, will, will lead to XSS. Here's a quick way to fix a large, we saw a large multi-million line application and locked it down and pushed it live in one day with this trick. Inner HTML is dangerous, I'll just wrap Dom Purify around that dangerous content and this risk goes away. This should be how the browser works natively and it will in the near future. But this is a quick way to fix older applications. Pre the early Ajax, we, browsers were inconsistent. We sent a lot of chunks of HTML around the DOM. So old apps is a quick fix. Again, we saw, I saw an app with part of my team and the, and the customer was like, we got a quote from another consultancy who want a quarter million dollars to rewrite the whole JavaScript layer. And I'm like, I can, I'll do it for 20 bucks in a cheeseburger. And they're like, quite compelling. And there's so, a sales guy here going, what is wrong with you, Jim? $10 in a cheeseburger? I, it's called karma. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So uh, we just found all the dangerous sinks. That they were using this per standard. It did that in about 3,000 places. We're done in a day. That app was being pushed live, which radically less XSS. Love this library. So, and, and what, the other reason I like this library, remember one of the principles of secure user interface in my opinion is make sure the user interface does the defense automatically. Try not to depend on server side constructs. As we move into React and Angular and using this library, I can build a, a, a secure user interface where every single variable from the server is a dangerous payload by, by using React Angular and proper DOM purification where needed. So, yeah, there we go. What, here's, let's look at DOM XSS now. Let's, let's go a little deeper into it. DOM XSS happens usually when we're moving data back and forth between different JavaScript functions. All of these functions, eval, document write, set, these are all extremely dangerous. In fact, most of our assignments and function calls in JavaScript are very dangerous. If I get bad content to that variable, to that assignment or variable, it leads to XSS, it leads to JavaScript execution. I want to use I want to use safe functions, but very few of them are. And here they are, right? This is the safe collection of functions. Something like text content, class name, setting a safe attribute, dot value is safe. The, the, and inner HTML is safe if I'm properly DOM purifying it. The point I'm trying to make is with a little bit of knowledge. A developer will understand how I can safely push data around in JavaScript and these problems go away. It doesn't harm innovation. It's just a little bit of knowledge and a very simplistic trick and Dom XSS just goes away. But the problem is, what if you're writing code for several months or years without this knowledge, you're gonna write lots of XSS and unwinding it is extremely painful and difficult. Again. Why I like that Dom Purify trick so much. So again, my recommendation is heavily educate your team about proper user interface security before a project starts is a most cost effective way to address this issue. Also, let's, let's look at JSON. We're doing a lot of JSON slinging in the modern area. Oh, before we get to JSON, yeah, all of jQuery is dangerous, pretty much all of it. And, there, and, there's, yeah, all, and there, there's a few safe things to do in jQuery, like .text and dot val, and dot html if you're dom purifying. So there's very few safe ways to populate the dom, even in jQuery. And, and a little bit of knowledge goes a long way to building secure applications. So what does this slide mean? Remember, I just said that text content is safe, but some developer used it like this in a JSP, and this led to XSS, where this use of text content is completely safe. Why is text content dangerous here? And why is text content safe there? Any thoughts, folks? Yes, sir. No, no hand, just, just shout it out. What's that? Can you go a little louder? Wh which one? Up here, right? Where, where is this being rendered? What part of my architecture is this logic being processed? It's on the server. So before this even renders, I can manipulate that request data, break out of this uh, text content, and just add my own evil script. Because we are not even executing JavaScript yet, we're assembling it on the server. Now down here, we're in the middle of JavaScript execution. Data's being passed in the .js file, data's being passed to this variable, 
and that use of text content is safe. So if you're moving data back and forth between JavaScript functions, text content is safe. If you're server side rendering content, all bets are off. You have to do manual escaping yourself. So let's, let's look at JSON next. We're winding, near, we're winding down near the end here. What else do we got? So when you're parsing JSON, use json.parse. If you use eval in an older browser especially, that could lead to XSS. If you're gonna embed JSON, don't use stringify. There's a lot of React and other documentation that says if you're gonna embed a piece of JSON on a page, then stringify it, which leads to attacks like this. This is nonsense. String of, there's nothing secure about stringify. If you see a developer using it, block them from checking it in. There's no good use for this function. We should be using JSON serialization. It's a safe use of serialization. So here, JSON stringify, there's my bypass and the script because double tildes are not recognized in the browser, and I got my bypass in a pretty trivial fashion. What we should do is something we see from Yahoo, right? We should do, we should do serializing of JSON. There's a lot of different JSON serializers in the JavaScript ecosystem. The best is from Yahoo, it's old school, well-maintained, still maintained to this day. When you serialize chunk of JSON and embed it, all the dangerous characters are escaped as we would expect, and it's a safe way to embed JSON in the browser, usually for performance purposes. All right, sandboxing. If you have an advertisement, first of all, secure applications don't use ads. Secure applications do not embed ads from third-party trashy advertising networks. This is easy for me to say, but I'm, 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 I'm messing with a multi-billion dollar industry, so I don't want to deny the reality of having to do ads to monetize some of your websites, but realize you're taking a big risk. And I recommend what you do is drop your ads in an iframe sandbox with, the, with, and you can, with all the different scripts turned off. Now you can visually render an ad and disable JavaScript. Your ad networks will pay you a lot less. If you're gonna embed an ad directly on your site though, that's, you're basically saying, I don't care about security in my opinion because it's an easy path of attack. So I, I, and I, I like new browsers. Anybody play with Brave at all? What does Brave have? Brave is a browser from Brandon Ike and the old Firefox team. What, what is Brave doing? They're doing ad blocking by default. That's what a secure browser does. We're not gonna see that from other players anytime soon though. So this, I've, in fact, anybody ever see the site JS Fiddle by any chance? This is a developer site. You can upload your own JavaScript to it and it executes on the site. What do you think of that security people? That should give you pause, right? but they deliver that JavaScript in a sandboxed iframe with allow scripts turned on, everything else turned off, and they deliver it from a different domain, which is a, it's a different origin and a different domain. Cookies are bound by the domain, everything else is bound by the origin. Those, these are different things. So they've, shut, they've isolated this content from both the origin and the domain, and they have a sandboxed iframe, which is a unique origin, and now you can execute JavaScript in your website from a third party in a secure fashion. It's, a, it's, a, it's stunt development, but it's doable. So we're back to this part, we're back to the final part of the grid. How, how are we on time, ma'am, I ask? 15 minutes. That includes questions, excellent. So let's look at, let's go to, let's go to Rome for a second, right? Let's go to Rome. Two years ago in Rome, we saw two very outstanding Google engineers uh, Michael, where are they? Yeah, M Michelle Spagnolo and Lucas Weichelbaum. I think they're here at this conference, right? Go see their talk. They're awesome. With a, depending on your perspective, this talk is either a very awesome name or a very unfortunate name. Making CSP great again. This is the best talk on content security policy of all time. And it's and again, CSP is a response header. It's meant to. It's meant to allow you to programmatically disable and limit what the browser can do. As soon as you turn on content security policy, a whole bunch of things take effect right away. It's just a response header. Right away, inline JavaScript stops working. Uh, right, what else works? So, so inline script stops working, the eval function is turned off, and the browser is limited in how it can execute JavaScript. And for years, CSP has been live, how many people are using CSP in this room in their work? One, yeah, like 
a good number, like 20% of you. But overall, CSP is very elusive, or people use CSP policies that are very easy to bypass. And for most developers, moving to CSP is painfully difficult because of the individual customization you need for every page. That's why all you raised your hand. Your consultant's probably charging people to roll out CSP per page. I don't think that's a good idea, though. I don't think that kind of whitelisting effort and manual policy creation, I don't think the benefits are worth it. I think this should be your policy. Now, this is a, a, this is a two year old slide. I am eager to look at a slide that has a better description of CSP in the modern world. Two years later, I think this is the best out there. So what this policy does is, so this is again, this is, a, from, this is a slide directly from these two gentlemen who are here today. So we have a CSP policy that says, let's, let's nonce our inline script. Let's automatically allow uh, dependencies from one library to bubble up to the top. Let's make sure that we're allowing unsafe inline only if it's a very old version of the policy, and let's revert to a whitelist only for old versions of the policy. So in a new browser, we're CSP level three. We have a nonce, which means we can add a nonce to inline CSP. We have script dynamic, which says any chunk which is nonced, allow the whole hierarchy of those files to automatically load. And, and, and as soon as we turn on a nonce, unsafe inline, I'm sorry, as soon as we nonce, unsafe inline is turned off. And as soon as we put on strict dynamic, which is automatic propagation, it turns off the whitelist. Now that we drop down to an older browser, CSP level two, same exact policy, mind you, the nonce takes effect. Strict dynamic never worked in CSP2, didn't exist. So unsafe inline is still disabled because I'm not saying, and, and the wildcard policy shows up saying, any JavaScript over HTTPS is allowed to load. This is not a strict policy, but the point is we're trying to make a deliverable policy that developers can use that will have backwards compatibility across older versions of CSP. This pulls it off. It's, I, I've, I was teaching a company recently, a very large food company. It's one of the engineers who ran their main domain, which is complex, pushed this out in the middle of class because it, it got through his DevOps automation. A little, I was a little shocked, but it was, it's awesome. It's easy to roll this out. And, it's, and last, as we fall back to a CSP level one browser, notches don't work, strict dynamic doesn't work, and we have a very unsecure policy, unsafe inline, and, any, and, and uh, any HBS site as a whitelist. Well, you're at CSP level one in the first place. Nopsing doesn't exist, and you're using inline JavaScript. I can't help you here. So this is set up to fall back properly and still at least be enabled in an older browser. I love this because the CSP level one, which requires strict inline, uh, lack of inline script, I've seen people mess with it for years and not push it live. And as soon as Notsing shows up, we see it get pushed live in days. And as soon as this shows up, strict dynamic CSP level three policy, it, it becomes, we can deliver it in the middle of class, right? So, this is this, all together now. This is how you stop XSS. What, if this was a Facebook relationship status, what would it be? It's complicated. It's complicated. How important is this risk category? If you care about secure websites, you've got to take this seriously. So the whole point of this talk is, is it's complicated. It requires a rich amount of understanding of how the browser works and how to build user interfaces. And if you don't actively work with developers from day one to ensure that this knowledge is, is across any developer's mind, then you're likely to get insecure apps. And if you start building complicated JavaScript, weeks, months, and months without security in mind, Unwinding that mess and making it secure is gonna be very expensive and problematic in most situations. So I'd like you to strike this. Strike it early on in your teams and verify early and often to make sure you're building this right. That's my story. I'm very grateful you all uh, spent the time to listen. We have actually a lot of time for Q&A. I encourage you to ask questions. So any questions? Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, hey, uh, I was just wondering, are you aware of any uh, XSS payload in SVG tags? Because... Uh, I just showed you one at the beginning of the talk. Let me show it to you again. Look at, look, let's go look at Gareth Hayes' polygon. And there are tons of SVG payloads. This is just, this is just one, right? 
Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Come on, Gareth, where are you? Where are you? Right there. This, this, is, this is exactly an SVG payload oh, okay. right there. Boom. And this is, there's, there's many of them. It's an area a lot of developers don't lock down. They don't actually do good validation of SVG markup, so it's a common attack payload that the, the big players like to use. There you go, sir. Okay, thanks. Any quite more questions? Please ask questions. Help me out here. Yes, sir. How do you feel, Jim, about um, single page applications uh, where you still have to do server side rendering um, of content? And so you have the SVG protections and then you have the server side protections. How do you feel about those mixed environments? Well, let's take a step back. You're talking about Angular and React, right? Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to do server side rendering of those, of those frameworks, period, Jack. Those are all that you're supposed to build React and Angular templates as static pieces of content, push them to the browser, make round trip AJAX calls primarily to get JSON, and then deal with that framework client side where it knows how to handle untrusted content. If you're doing server side React or Angular rendering mixed with request data, that leads to a vulnerability category called, mark, called template injection, where I can now inject content into your page that's rendering React and add and change React code. At that point, I don't care what you're doing, it's game over. Now, and you know that's my traditional philosophy on this, Jack. And you're like, yeah, Jim, but I live in a different world called the real world where developers still do this a lot. And you gotta be careful here, Jack. If it's like an integer, and you're dynamically adding an integer to a template, right? Then we can validate that it's an integer, use an integer class, and we know for sure it's an integer. You cannot inject through an integer. You can do access control bypass through it sometimes, but you can't inject JavaScript to an integer, and now that's safe to do server-side rendering. Let's say you're putting a username doing server-side rendering mixed with React. It's just letters and numbers only, nothing else. Okay, I can do that safely, but start adding spaces and I can hop out of an attribute. Start giving me any meta characters. Look at the different ways of getting access into your site. As soon as the content is anything but the most simplistic of content, these problems show up. So you can do stuff, Jack, like server-side uh, HTML sanitization or run XSS filters through server-side content. You and I both know that's not complete defense. So you're talking about a dangerous pattern if you can validate strictly because the content is simple, you may get away with it, but if that content is not simple, like a URL, a chunk of markup, an address, good luck validating, there's no way you can validate an address that makes it secure from XSS in my opinion. So that, that's my long answer to a short question. Fair answer? Any more questions? Oh no, Dimitri. Dimitri's, Dimitri has been an AppSec pro for about 20 years now, working for one of the largest internet companies out there. All right, wait, wait, wait. No, 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 let me ask a question. <laughs> let's go, let's do this, Dimitri, let's go, what do you got? Um, so I want, let's say you, you want to detect those vulnerabilities with static analysis. So uh, you, let's say you're, already... you, you're charged with the task of like uh, detecting this in million lines of code or writing a system that analyzes pull requests and try to like, what would, re what would you recommend? Are there any tools, libraries, or how would you My recommend recommendation to go is it? if any vendor tells you, just buy my discovery tool that will solve all your problems, find all your bugs, Jack Bauer them off the roof of your building and move on. Do not, the, 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 real, the reality here about dynamic or static tools is never depend, someone, everyone, I, I, need, I need some tweeting. Let's get, everyone get your tweets ready, you ready? Get your tweets ready. I'm at Manico, tweet this out. Never depend on one tool to do application security ever. The best out there will use a DevOps, work, uh, a DevOps um, automated testing chain and throw everything in the kitchen sink at it and do good triage and, and combine that with pen testing, combine that with static analysis tuned to go fast, combine that with dynamic analysis tuned to go fast, combine that with dynamic analysis done by a, a developer, uh, sorry, done by a security pro done slowly and carefully, combine that with static analysis done slowly and carefully. All those techniques together, you'll still miss stuff. So my answer to you is, the question is, how do we find cross-site scripting statically? Is that the basic question? And my answer is, don't depend on any one vendor. I'm, I'm talking about my own company, I'm talking about anyone. Have a plethora of different tools in place. Rotate those tools over time, and you'll have the best work with automation 
to find those bugs. Number two, all of that's going to miss stuff. So you want to augment that with the human being expert if you have a high risk application. They'll miss stuff too. So this is why content security policy is so important to save you when mistakes are made. Next question. Yeah. Is that a fair answer, Dimitri? Uh, by the way, uh, Gareth Hayes, whose tweet is on the screen, is presenting here tomorrow at 1.30. Yep. So don't miss his talk. I, I agree. Uh, more questions? More questions. Raise your hand, please. Nobody? OK, uh, thank you very much, Jim, for an amazing talk. Thank you, talk. everyone. Thank you. <laughs>